Cartography is the science of drawing maps. Mapping means to outline, to contour, effectively to frame. So let's map today's presentation. It will be a labyrinth, not a maze. So you're assured a very, very safe arrival at the end of the presentation. What exactly is our destination then? Well, typically, maps are used to connect places A to B. The only connection I'm ever interested in is not from A to B, but from you to me. And so, where in the world are we? Our individual avatar, our own proverbial Waldo. Where is my home in this world? Where really is this map that identifies each of us individually? On which map honestly, do I find you? That's the whole point of this presentation. A very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for sharing your afternoon with us for our 64th presentation titled Cartography. So as indicated in the monthly write-up that was sent last week, we will be meandering today. So the mental compass for our journey is that all maps tell a story. It is effectively fiction garbed as facts. Mapping space and time is all relative. So the Nourishment Projects is about joyous curiosity and being part of something much larger than ourselves. Here are some of the references that inform this presentation. The challenge of mapping our life. Where do I start when what I'm searching is my own place in this world? And in fact, where are you? Where do you begin that? That is a whopper of a journey we'll be taking today. So I thought, let's start mapping something easy or rather something easier than mapping you. Let's start with mapping God. Let's map paradise, effectively the Garden of Eden. Well, here it is, heaven mapped here on earth of the 13th century. Make no mistakes, this is a map. Please reframe your perspective. Think of it in terms of infographics, of current maps like this one. Because remember again, maps tell a story. It should now begin to make more sense now. I, I, at least I hope it does. Because this one maps places associated with famous people, especially famous women in New York. So the symbolic A's and B's on a map can really be anything because they are just standing in for something. And in this case, instead of a city, why not a person? So I'm gonna to point to some. Look here, Bette Midler, she was here. Yoko Ono is over there. Suzanne Sontag, Nora Ephron. This is in one part, like down here, you have Lady Gaga. If you move forward to the, on the east, one sees, well, I like her, thanks to my daughter, Nicki Minaj. <laughs> then we also see Billie Jean King, tons of people on this map. And this work by the cartographer Molly Roy, she's from the similar area of India I'm from, but we're not related. I would be very happy to be related to somebody this talented. Her work is remarkable. Look at this one, an atlas for water, polluted water. Imagine what parts of Chicago looks like on a map like this. Then imagine Flint, Michigan. It is telling a story in a snap. It's so effectively done. So with that lens, Let's return to the 13th century map. It is again, not a mere painting, but it is a T-O map, or you could also call it O-T map, it stands for orbit terrarium, circle of the lands. To give a context of this, the letter T right here inside the letter O, that is what it T O or O T map is about. So usually the Western cartographers from the 13th century divided the earth into three sides, one part Europe, another part Asia, and the third Africa. Europe is divided from Africa by a sea or a body of water. So the T O map depicts paradise on earth because that's what they were interested in. 
in this illuminated manuscript, the accomplished miniaturist, and he is definitely talented, his name was Mansell, placed on the respective continent, a personification of the three sons of Noah. I'm gonna point now, one sees Mount Ararat in Asia with Noah's Ark resting on the top. So medieval Europe had a very vague idea of Asia. Essentially that Asia is large and it's to the east. Latin texts had explained paradise had been placed in the east, somewhere in Eastern Asia, but no one ventured to say exactly where. So they were literally given a carte blanche, put it somewhere, and that they did. So there again, you see the TO, Asia, Europe, Africa. That's the setup for these things. Context of these maps is very, very important because these are biblical stories. So medi medieval maps known as Mapa Mundi illustrate religious importance. They are locations in salvation history being piled on top of time. So these maps, although this is not a map, this is just telling the biblical story of Genesis. These maps intermingle history and geography of the Bible. So for the inhabitants of Christendom of the 13th century, the existence of the Garden of Eden was as important as the geographical location of a London or a Paris or a Rome or I don't know, Constantinople. The crucial factor in these maps is history, not geography. The cartographer's limiting factor will actually surprise you. It might even make you laugh. So when they want to map, where is this paradise of Genesis? Mapping this location in sound mathematics, geography and astronomy was doomed to fail. If you ponder why, I will tell you. Because of climate, in paradise, there are no seasons. It's eternal spring. Fruits and flowers never fail. Harvest is plentiful year round. That's exactly how it's described. So where on earth is such a place for 13th century cartographers? Because you see, Florida hadn't been discovered yet. I would have healthily suggested Uganda because it's got great temperature there, but these cartographers, because of their limited geography, couldn't imagine a place where its temperature is wonderful all through the year, spring abounds all through the year, so they couldn't. So again, Mapa Mundis, were not utilized as maps for travel or geographical education, but as religious lessons being taught through a visual mean. So this is effectively a religious infographic. So now what exactly is it showing? So the first trick to decoding a medieval map Amundi is to rotate it 90 degrees clockwise because medieval maps were oriented to the east rather than our not. We oriented very differently from our ancestors. So the verb to orient literally means to point something towards the east. Hence the term oriental for everything from the far east. So it's, I don't find the term insulting at all. So I don't know why it has to be not used because it makes more sense now, doesn't it? The oriental because it's saying to the east. So this map I'm going to point now is centered around the place for them on the land that they knew, Jerusalem. And here I'm going to show you next a close up. So there is Jerusalem. And if you had looked, because you can literally, I almost my eyes shimmer looking at these maps with a, I will show you. I mean, I constantly use for this presentation. I had to use magnifying glass. They were so tedious, but they were fun. These maps really do reward patience. So if you look very closely, here's Rome. And if you keep looking on these maps, you will see Paris, you will see London, places like that. But not all these depictions were strictly biblical. I'm gonna point now, the map also features a line of 12 peculiar beings down here, if you can follow the arrow, representing the mysterious and unknown inhabitants of Central Africa, because you see here is the Red Sea, down here is Africa. So once you just reorient your perspective, it starts to make a bit more sense. Then the Red Sea is always the easy identifiable factor. Another map, one of the earliest maps actually, 12th century Soli map, 
The map depicts three continents, again, Asia, Africa, Europe, surrounded by a world ocean. Close up again, the world ocean, they colored green, and it's not blue, they use green. And I'm only pointing it out because it's, you need two colors to make green. So they put effort in this. So the Greek city of Delos is at the center. And it was noted for pagan temples. So I found it interesting, that's the center. And I'm gonna point now, again, if you look with you know uh, magnifying glass, you'll see there's Macedonia right there. So there are many, many identifiable things on this map. And I really like the stark beauty of this. I think they're actually lovely. Another famous map, the Epstorf world map has the Garden of Eden at the top. It's in this rectangle. So how do we see this again? Actually, I found one thing very amusing. The reason for the proverbial shining city on the hill again is because it needs to be outside the earthly climate limits, right? They cannot put this anywhere near Africa because it's hot there. The equatorial zones, they call it torrid because their paradise did not have hot temperatures like that. So they couldn't put it anywhere there. So the only place that they could put it is way up on the top, away from any you know, denotions of where we would consider it to be proper. That's the reason why it's usually placed on the top. They want perpetual spring. So somewhere in the east is what they're saying paradise is. And this is going to be oriented to the east because orientation is east in general. These cartographers would never discuss climate change. And I found that very prescient considering our times. I'm not going to delve too deeply into any one map, though you're encouraged to go down the rabbit holes for all these maps are fascinating and available free online. And the reference marks them all up in the beginning. If anyone wants them, just send me an email and I'll send you the list of references. This 13th century map now that we're going to go to is literally blinding beauty. I would not recommend you look at this one, Luigi. It hurt my eyes, but it is very interesting. The blinding beauty is almost that adjective is a warning. How do you again make sense of these maps? Well, first of all, please recollect the TO of the map. Paradise is going to be on top, and then you need to orient it to the east, thereby the three continents again, Asia, Europe, Africa. Keeping this structure in mind, let's go back to that map that we saw, and I just to help it out, I put an index in there. What I found very odd is that they labeled the map incorrectly. They put Africa where it should be Europe, so they reversed it, even though the countries are labeled correctly. So if you look at number 22, 22 is Scotland, 23 is England. So it's on the side that should be Europe, except they labeled whoever the cartographer was, labeled it incorrectly. The center for this one again is Jerusalem. Can you imagine the cartographer having to explain this error on such an expensive creation? Because this is vellum. And you are allowed to scrape off mistakes. So I wondered why it hadn't been corrected. I don't know why they did that. So if you look now around here in this nook is Constantinople. And that's situated very correctly on the strait dividing Europe and Asia. Here again, one sees it. Constantinople drawn on its own map before the Byzantine city fell to the Turks. Again. A reminder, maps tell a story, these maps. History piled on geography. So keep remember, look at the date when this was made. So at this time in the 14th century, the Fourth Crusade has already sacked Constantinople. And that is evident if you look now right there in the ruins right here. Do you see that ruined drawing? So it's giving you very big clues. One also notices the Roman Hippodrome where they would be having the chariot races and the double walls surrounding the city along with the moat. We see that on the left. And I don't need to point it out because I'm sure you've spotted it because these maps are fun to look at. The great cathedral of St. Sophia, which is now the venerated mosque, Hagia Sophia. So there is Constantinople from 14th, 15th century. Another great one, I think it's beautiful the Venetian mapmaker Fra Mauro's masterpiece. 
that he is Venetian matters in this case, for map making is enhanced by commercial knowledge and trade implies transportation. So these are times of the Silk Road, things are going back and forth, along with it is information. Communication with the larger world profoundly shapes the meaning of information, even today, especially today, and we have so many options. Eyewitness descriptions from the 15th century merchants and allowing for some hearsay ignited Fra Mauro's imagination. So what is the first step for us realizing what is being offered? The first thing to do is, again, orient the map to familiarize it with our perspective. So it's been turned. Having received information from the Portuguese traders, because Venice is a very big trading city. They were also slave traders. Fra Mauro depicts Africa, look how important this is, as almost a separate continent with the ocean sea, because that's what they call the Pacific Ocean, joining the Indian Ocean, which is different than what the others of his times were depicting it as. And he's doing this four decades prior to Vasco da Gama's voyage to India. And he's doing it here on this map. He shows it to you directly because here is Africa. You have to give them Libya what, because they haven't seen any of this. Here is India. So he's connecting all this. Fra Mauro likely gained his knowledge from the Venetian contacts with Arab mariners because Arab trades, Muslim trades are going on. And also that the fact that the Portuguese encountered Muslim traders. So you're trading information. This comes back. All around these times, remember the Silk Road, Marco Prolo traveling, all that information sharing between the merchants, the map makers, one feeds the other. Nothing happens on an information vacuum. So doesn't it thrill you? Take a bird's eye view of our current times. This explosion of online information, our unprecedented access to one other, to new ideas, to new perspectives. Right now, equally amazing discoveries and growths are unfolding. Doesn't it thrill you that it's happening during our times? These are exciting times we live in. So a 15th century map from the Italian state of Florence, which was also a flourishing silk trade despite being challenged by France because Louis the 14th was an astute businessman. He started developing the silk trades in France. So what do we see in this map? First of all, no Garden of Eden, nothing of the sort. This has nothing to do with religion. I'm going to point now, these rope-like depictions are actually mountains because they're copying the depictions of the Islamic maps because that's how the Islam, Islamic maps depicted mountains. And so remember, Italy, because this is an Italian map, is trading with the Ottomans. So the Islamic influence is easy to recognize, starting with the undisputed influence of Islam on the world of Renaissance illuminated manuscripts. It's undisputed. You can just see the influence that came in. So the reason for my including this map is, I'm going to point now, please observe the Western all the way down to the Southern coast of Africa. All those ports are named, documented. But beyond that, nothing. You see that? The names are here. There's nothing in the rest of the map even though they knew there was something there. So why is that? Because these are the things that make me smile, actually purr with pleasure. It's that lived experience of a map. Most likely, whichever explorer or ship's captain, the cartographer aligned with, whoever was providing the data, that ship crew likely had threatened mutiny around this point. And so the captain had to turn back up. And so he had no further data to share with the cartographer. He just got stuck with the wrong captain. That's why it's only marked up to a point and not beyond. So when you look at these maps, you know, you can find so many things to amaze you. So please keep in mind that although I'm focusing on Western map making, the rest of the world at that same time had their own well-developed traditions. So the European Dark Ages, ages approximately you know, 6 through 11 century and a little around that time, that dark ages did not apply to places outside Europe. 
because even accounting for the Mongols, the Tong culture, the Song cultures in, in, in China, the Chola dynasties in India, Jayavarman in Cambodia, Angkor Wat, all of that is going on during what we call the European Dark Ages. It's not dark anywhere else. Those non-European cities are incredibly wealthy, massive wealth bursting with creativity and commerce. And so during those times, you have documentation of Chinese traders all the way to Kenya, which they then called Mombasa. And look, Islamic maps are some of my favorites because of their elegant curation. Now, please notice the cultural differences. There are no figures depicted on these Islamic maps. North is depicted with an arrowhead. So it's telling you which way is north. So the reefs are depicted by crosses at sea. So you will see crosses on the map because it's telling you where the reefs are for the, uh, for the ships because these are all useful for trade. And if there are black dots by the shore, which you see here, that's where the reefs are if you're near the shore. So the symbol on the left of this ship by the strait, this little symbol there, I hope you can see it. What that is doing, it's indicating um, um, a spring, which is a very important source for fresh water. Sea captains would want to know that. So the map with refined restraint shows only what is needed. I marvel at the cartographer's sense of confidence, nothing to prove, so no redundant flourishes or ornamentation. Absolutely stark beauty. Hats off, fantastically done. And here again, another one by the same cartographer, comprehensive coverage, accurate, and the utility is there too. So this area, the previous one was by Gallipoli. This is showing Beirut and Tripoli. Again, in here, orientation is shown north pointing down with the arrow. So Beirut was a principal port for the spice merchants from Venice. So this was a very important map. Please observe the cedar forest at the foot of Mount Ara um, of the Mount Lebanon. All the details are there. The crosses again on this map indicate reefs and the interesting lack of black dots by the shore means there were not many or there were no dangerous shores. So the ships didn't have to worry unlike the previous map of Gallipoli. Another map, this one created by the German cartographer Martellus, is the best surviving map of the world as Christopher Columbus knew of the world as he made his first voyage across the Atlantic. This is the world that he imagined. And Columbus likely used a copy of this map while planning his journey. Its depiction of Europe and the Mediterranean Sea is more or less accurate. So I made a better copy of it than this one because that's the original map. So modern you know, digital screening shows you what it might have looked like. So the depiction of Mediterranean is more or less accurate or at least it's recognizable. But if you see the Southern Africa, it has a very odd shape like a boot with a toe pointing east. And Asia is equally twisted out of shape. And it's quite interesting how that large island in the South Pacific, you can see it on the right, it's roughly where Australia can actually be found. And that must have been a lucky guess because Europeans hadn't discovered that continent, Australia, until about a century later. So that was a very good guess, nice conjecture by the cartographer or whatever information he or he would have gathered. There's no she going on here. This map, is being included because it's important for Silk Road merchants. Shown here are the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. And these approaches from the east are, in, are very important for the maritime route to the Silk Road because this is where expensive cargo would be transferred for the overland leg for transshipment to Venice and Genoa. So this is a very important, important land area. Effectively, what I wanted to show you is the 16th century idea of supply chain, how it's going all the way through. What I also found interesting is that the inclusion of this area up here, which is what we would call the Central Asian zone, the Samarkand, all that area, because these are very important land routes for the Silk Road. So the cartographer acknowledges it, but he leaves it blank. And look at the term, I'm gonna point up here, I'm gonna move this screen for a second. It says Tartar. 
And Tartar is that mysterious area was labeled Tartar. And you will hear that term if you're an opera fan. If you, for example, know the opera Turandot, the principal character Kalaf, the one who sings Nesum Dorma, he is said to come from the land of the Tartar. So that's where that term comes from. Or Tartar source comes from there also. Anyway, pirates, as was um, indicated in the write-up, pirates depend on treasure maps. Here's a pirate, Sir Francis Drake's treasure map. In the sense, Francis Drake really was an English pirate. He was favored by Queen Elizabeth because he successfully robbed the Imperial Spanish ships of their gold. Drake might also have reached California, you know, by San Francisco, because there's a place called Drake's Bay. They say that might be named after him. But why I included this one is that it shows the new world. You see America in there. It's one of the first maps that's showing here that shows America, the new world. What's also interesting to me is that the Atlantic Ocean below the equator is called the Ethiopian Sea. Isn't that something? They call this area, you can see the writing here, Ethiopian Sea. So if you look in this ship right here, I blew it up in the next picture. This is the close up from his ship, the Drake's, uh, one of the ships from Drake's fleet, because the other ones didn't make it, is the Golden Hind. And so if you go back to the map, the corner vignettes, I'm only showing this to show how much effort is put in here. It's capturing history onto geography because these, these things happened at different times. It was almost a two year voyage for him. They are illustrating the Golden Hind, how it ended up in the Malaccas and Java and parts in California. So it's showing all of that in the 16th century. And so this is a tip of my hat to you, uh, Jack, because we had done a presentation on the nutmeg. This little island, the Malaccas, was the Fort Knox of their time, of its time, because it was the only source for nutmeg, which was worth its weight in gold. And so how note how the tree is being given rightful due by the cartographer. It was phenomenally expensive and this tiny island is tied up to how America, Britain got Amsterdam and it eventually became New York because they traded for this. It's a very interesting history. So the 16th century is when England starts coming into her own power. So they've just had a recent, at least that's shown, there's a two or three copies of the Armada um, portrait. This is one of them. It is showing clearly in the back England's victory, naval victory over Spain, over the Spanish fleet, hence the Armada portrait. Truth be told, the weather greatly helped the English. So it wasn't necessarily due to their superior Eng English admiralty that they won that uh, battle. But news that Spain had been defeated by England spread through the Spice Islands. And potentates in those islands love to align with the rising stars, the rising sun. They don't want to line up with losers. And so they started lining up, partnering with England. And so that's really this one very strategic victory helped cement England. So can you see how Elizabeth layered in pearls because pearls were extremely expensive. They didn't have cultured pearl. There were no Mickey Motos there. Layered in pearls, her hand resting on the globe projects world domination power. This is a PR painting for England and it connects our narrative to another aspect of cartography, which is the globe. So there are countlessly jaw dropping, beautifully historic globes easily available for view online. I don't feel they're worthy of the one hour you generously give to the nourishment projects. We attempt to offer a perspective you may not have considered yet to spark curiosity. Anyone can do pretty pictures and I will not ever try to waste your time with fluff. This globe is a colorful mixture of credible new knowledge and incredible stories from unknown parts of the world. The reason it's included and why I'm smiling when I selected it, or I was smiling when I selected it, is that due to the date of the completion of this globe that was completed before Columbus returned from his voyage, this globe, as you turn it, does not show America. It does not show the new world. So the entire section of that side, of that existing world of ours, 
wasn't represented. It was like the dark side of the moon. Isn't that something? Speaking of which, this I wanted to show you. Here is a lunar globe. I did not know there was something of a lunar globe. So the invention of the telescope in the early 17th century allowed the moon to be studied in great details. And there were many luminaries, pun intended, who loved to study the moon, including Christopher Wren, that great architect. So they really, really studied the moon. And here is a lunar globe. And the details of the rabbit or whatever shape you call the craters of the moon are engraved on this globe. So globes were and are being made of many materials. There's even a jewel studded one in Iran with 51,000 gemstones. In general, I prefer things that discreetly <laughs> reveal themselves only to the devoted. I don't like flashy things. So the ones I select, hopefully, are worthy of your time. So when they're making these globes, excellence in high standards to workmanship is evident in many of these 17th century globes because these are costly items that they are, you know, um, examples of wealth. And globe makers, because it was very um, competitive, they were not forthcoming about their methods of construction. So globical papers, what you put on these globes are known as gores. So these are called gores. You would put strips of this around the globe itself. They were glued to that molding using flower paste. You know, you even now you can print these gores and construct your own globe. You can print whatever picture you like. You can do it. You can have a ton of fun with it. And so from small to very, very large terrestrial and celestial globes were made. They were again displays of wealth and modest globes were great instruments for the permanent wealth of learning. I personally find pocket globes charming. If you remove the hook here, the whole world literally is in your hands. The amount of geographical information in these pocket globes may be spare, but pocket globes are abundant with charm. So if you look, the celestial gores, so inside, lets the heaven appear in the concave form, right? So when you open this pocket globe up, there's your terrestrial globe. And the celestial globe is in there concave, just as we see it from the earth when we look up. Because if it were not concave, if it was coming down, that would be rather frightening. So this rare beauty's northern and southern hemispheres can be pulled apart and inside, is revealed an armillary sphere with an illustrated zodiac band complete with the sun in the center. It's really something what you discover, the imagination and the skill, the craftsmanship these people have. It's definitely what, worth the time. As the teaching of geography became more widespread to children, the globes attempted to encourage the development of manual skills along with providing some fun. You know, everybody wants to learn, but it's good to have fun so they don't zone off. So this globe was apparently invented by a Miss Cowley and it had 14 sections. And an instruction booklet was also provided when you got this globe. So the publishing company promoted it as, and I quote, for the instruction and amusement of young minds. That's how this was publicized. I like the fact that even this early in the 19th century, marketing was important. So speaking of amusing, I find this incredibly amusing. Behold this, a small cardboard box containing a tiny globe and a strip of concertinate paper of people in national costumes. What I also found charming, honestly speaking, is the mistake on the box. Perhaps ironic also, because if this is an educational device, you should spell its, I-T-S, not I-T-Z the earth and its inhabitants. That's okay, it's so still cute. And I took just one little snapshot. A parade of costumes is almost like a meet your neighbors or perhaps your trading partners scenario. You see, there's China next to Persia. They are trading Silk Route. An educational game of a globe. We see one right there. And few of these have survived 
because these pieces were easily lost. And what I suspect many of you are familiar with in our educational aspect of learning about the world, a map. This is something very similar to what I grew up with plastered on my walls in Calcutta in India. That's where I grew up. Digital versions of these feed many a mind now. I still look at them. So now I'm going to give a friendly reminder from the beginning of our presentation. Again, maps tell a story. They are mainly an abstraction. So barring flat earthers, most people accept that the world is basically spherical. The map that what we saw right before this is a two dimensional representation of a three dimensional entity, the sphere. Now, if you were asked to peel an orange and then to flatten the peel pieces completely without breaking or stretching any part of the peel, could you? Give it a thought for a second. Would you be able to do that? Most likely not. But isn't that what we are doing when we do that to a map? This peeling of the tight shell around that round ball of a globe, it really isn't possible to do without distortion. What does that mean for us? The only way to reduce distortion is to triangulate the picture because that is the way to represent a three-dimensional object as accurately as possible by minimizing projection distortion. So, not this. This is a more accurate two-dimensional depiction of our world. The light blue is the inaccuracy that we grew up learning that what we learned and took to be true. Greenland mistakenly appears as the same size of Africa, where in reality, Africa's area is 14 times as large as Greenland. Madagascar, this island by East Africa, in our original map concept, looks the same size as Great Britain, whereas in reality, Madagascar is actually more than twice the size as Great Britain. There will be distortions whenever there are attempts to represent a curved elliptical surface as a flat planar surface. It's just bound to happen. It's called aspect ratio distortion. So what I'm showing now, the dark area are the actual sizes of these land masses. So the land masses hasn't changed. It's just the projection looks different. What I found very telling is that this has been known for decades. Why hasn't there been any attempt to correct our understanding? Because shouldn't we stop making, pun intended, mountains out of molehills? Because please note, the actual square footage hasn't changed. It's just the depiction of the land is changed. So this is actually Russia, not this wider space. Greenland, in reality, how it should be on a map versus what it is shown as. I found that, I don't know if not shocking, eye-opening. So it really was a challenge to determine how do I want to tell this story about cartography? Because as you can guess, the possibilities are endless. Aeronautical maps, I guess charts, that pilots employ when they're flying back and forth. On the water, historical maps like this Periplus, which is a manuscript document that depicts ports and coastal landmarks. It's been used from like the, almost the time of 2000 years ago because they were used by trade ships transporting goods from India to Italy and back. It's well documented. And it's equivalent now, the shipping routes for all those freights that those Amazon freights and every other freights going back and forth that sometimes clogged the Suez Canal, all this can be found digitally and the technology to continuously update the Google Maps, satellite communication. And it is this that allows us never to get lost, no matter where in the world you go, you can find yourself on a map. This conversation itself would make for a fascinating hour. The technology that 
lends us map nowadays. You can just look up anything, anywhere, in any level of information you want. Salient questions for this cartographers this day and age include, you know, who is the audience for your map? Because you can get inordinate amount of data to make these visual depictions. So who is your audience? What information needs to be conveyed? How much information is needed? Because honestly, I don't want to say who cares, but do we need these levels of information? It's just redundant information sometimes. I'm just giving this as an example. You've seen the maps, some of the previous maps from even Mapa Mundi. So much information, who needs it? Because I really feel we get flooded with unnecessary inputs constantly in every details of our lives. I like space in thought, hearing, and seeing. I like empty space. That is why probably I like these curated Islamic maps because it reminded me and, and just assured me that yes, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So even with the very credible problem of aspect distortion of world maps, cartographers nowadays have much more or as important pressing concerns such as Unexpected physical changes in our world. How do they happen? Sand dredging to create artificial lands. For example, within four years, Palm Jumeirah was created ready for inhabitation. So this is real estate property, which is a major tourist spot on every map. This is man-made space that affects our map. Dredging has and is continued to use to enlarge. I'm just showing an example, Singapore, but it's used to enlarge places like Bombay, San Francisco, many area. Also, dredging also, well, first and foremost, there's also glacial melting, which has unexpected consequences. So for example, when you look, the Russian Navy had discovered five new lands, islands, that was revealed by the melting glaciers in the remote Arctic. So this shows, will show up recently on the latest maps. The one that I was mentioning, these are politically volatile, dredging in the islands being made in, by China in the South China Sea. Th these are very troublesome con um, conversations that go on. These maps need to be constantly updated. Why? Among many other reasons, lines that are drawn that need to be militarily monitored while literally walking on eggshells because of this area, nuclear triggered regions of India, China, and Pakistan, these are all dotted boundaries. What looks like a harmless dot causes tremendous harm on land. What is true in the Far East is also true in the Middle East. And what's common ground here is that both these long-term regional conflicts resulted from British cartography. That's the reason it's included. I don't even have to say this. Many of these stateless refugees, they have no homeland, are the result of boundary disputes. But on the other spectrum, here is a successful global collaboration, a worldwide community when divisions aren't emphasized. We have so much possibility for wonderful collaboration. Honestly, if you look at this image, where exactly does one border separate one town from the other? If I showed this on a map, you will probably see it marked up with lots of dots and dashes. In reality, one can barely tell. And I'm not talking about political gerrymandering, nothing of the sort. For those who live in Chicago, simply think, Cook County from Will County or DuPage County, can you see if you were a bird, can you tell where the differences are? You cannot. You can tell by the tax you pay, but otherwise not happening. This bird's eye view is something I like because macro views do enlighten. Maps are an abstraction, actually. 
or more, most likely sometimes to me, a distortion of space and time. Because our human scale of time distorts our perception of space, at least to begin with. This landscape is not stable. If we lived for 12,000 years, and that is not a large number in geological sense of time, and map making involves geography, so the geological sense of time applies, because we need to be honest and do apples to apples comparison before we go about proportioning land that belongs to millions of species and should not just be subjugated that all area belongs to the dominion of the human. It's not right because nature draws lines also. And she has the final word for she works with the backdrop of eternity. Look what actually earth was 250 million years ago and the amount of time it took to become what we recognize even with projection distortion as earth, as our homeland. In our parlance, our real homeland has been redistricted by space and time. When she cooled and thawed down, and by she, I mean Mother Earth herself, humans came into existence, climate matters. Magma and time affects con continental drifts, which happens even now, it's continuously happening. What was once a floating landmass hit what is now Asia, because India, what we call India was almost island-like. It floated up, hit Asia, pushed the ground up to create what we call the entire Himalayan mountain range. And it is still rising. So forget two-dimensional distortion. The real cartographer isn't us. Space and time are cartographers forming boundaries with sea and mountains. And if you look at this, why is it called planet Earth? With the majority of water, isn't it more accurately planet water onto which we live? All of us, there is a kinship. Now, some in our human race harbor this psychologically distorted grandeur, you know, projections of grandeur that we are the chosen species. I don't know chosen by whom, because as far as I'm concerned, that frog size, look how little it must be to be under a lily pad. It belies its absolute right to this planet. It's right not to become extinct due to our ravenous appetites for land grabbing and pollution. We are insignificant from the point of view of time and space. Because look, take the larger view. Somewhere in this dust is planet Earth. This is a rendition of our galaxy. The entire universe, and this is just one galaxy, the entire universe is estimated to be about 93 billion light years in diameter and contains an estimated 100 billion galaxies. Can you imagine 100 billions of these, each of which contains billions of stars? Our Milky Way, in which planet Earth belongs, contains around 400 billion stars. We are one in 100 billion galaxies. Puts our place in order, doesn't it? Even more insignificant than that frog. It really puts us in the right space. To dehumanize us is very, to like decenter, not dehumanize, to decenter the human in our conversation is very important. It's very important to me. Because each of us is cradled, and by each of us, I mean every living creature, if you're talking about this planet, is cradled by Mother Earth as she dances through space in rhythmic measure. And she's dancing in quite a labyrinth, isn't she? Swirling like a Sufi dancer, a meditation in movement into this vortex. So now if you take the larger view, this vortex, this dance of her, is assured a safe arrival towards a destination of radiant joy. It is a labyrinth. Because look, from the moment of birth, year after year after year, 
through people and places, through the experiences of pain, of pleasure, with courage and with the deliberation, with the deep faith pull towards love, I map my way to you. Don't we all do that? Isn't that the only mapping that really matters? It does to me. It's just about the time. So thank you for your time. As always, I'm very grateful that you join us because it makes it more fun. I wish you joy and I'm going to stop sharing now.